Well, good morning and welcome to Bear Life Church. We welcome everybody here at the Moorhead campus and our Grayson campus and soon to be our Ashland campus. We're super excited about that, uh, what the Lord has in store. Also, we're really excited for everybody watching us online as well. So Christmas is around the corner. How many of you are excited about Christmas? You like Christmas? Yeah. Awesome, yeah, well, I'll tell you what, in my, there's not Christmas season in, in my house. It's always Christmas season at my house. If you know my wife, I'm, t- I'm listening, listening to Christmas music 24-7. I'll come home like it'll be June, and it'll be Christmas music going on. And so she's already told me one of her trees is gonna stay up until February. I'm like, honey, you do what you wanna do, all right? That's okay, because she loves Christmas. And I'm really excited about this series called Christmas Is. We're gonna have some fun walking through this, leading up to Christmas over the next few Sundays. So what is Christmas? Every one of us have our own opinion what Christmas is. Like if you sit down and say, ask somebody, tell me a little bit about Christmas, right? And, you, and if you're really spiritual, you're probably gonna say, it's Jesus is the reason for the season, right? I mean, you're gonna say that and you're gonna talk to some other people and they're gonna say, hey, it's about family. When you just get together and you have fun with your family and you get to hang out. If you ask probably a kid or so, they're gonna say, it's about presents. And mommy told me I've been a good boy. And so since I've been a good boy, they talk about the presents that they're gonna get. And for some people, it's, hey man, hallelujah, I got a day off. You know what I'm saying? You're just glad you got a day off from work, you know? Uh, And for a lot of people, honestly, it's just another day. It's just another day where we get to kind of eat good and hang out with the family, get a day off, and then hit right back to the grind, going back to work and, you know, just get back into the real world. And so for the next several, you know, weeks, or actually for the next, I would say, 30 some days, you're going to have all these crazy things happen. You're going to be traveling. You're going to be making plans. You're going to be finding out what crazy families you're not going to go to house this year, right? You know what I'm talking about? And you're going to be thinking about how we're going to have things on time. You're going to have all these things going on. And I just want us to slow down and don't miss miss really what I believe that the Lord wants to speak to us through this Christmas season, and that is really to define what is Christmas. We all have our opinion, but what is Christmas to, to me, what's Christmas to you, but also what is Christmas, you know, that we see according to the Scripture. Now, I'm, I'm going to preach over the next three weeks or probably over the most famous verse in the Bible. If you can think about what you think the most famous verse in the Bible, this is probably one of the most seen verse at least, I don't know if I would say quoted, could be the one of the most quoted, but at least the most seen verse in the Bible. How many college football fans we have in the house? Any college football fans? All right, there's seven of us. Cool, awesome. Uh, if you've been watching college football or you like watching football, you have seen this verse hanging up in end zones. And it's a verse that's very familiar, it's very simple, and it's probably one of the most quoted ones, or at least the most recognized one, and on a card or on a poster somewhere, and that is John 3.16. And I'm gonna walk through John 3, 16 for the next several weeks, and we're just gonna break this down and look at what truly, really is Christmas. You know, John 3, 16, and no matter what translation, you might rememberize it in, so it doesn't matter. You're probably, as a kid, gonna go back to the one that you remembered it in. But I'm gonna read to you what John 3, 16 says. It says, for God so loved the world that he did what? That he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. You'll die physically, but you won't die spiritually. You will not perish, but you will have eternal life. I want to appeal to you this morning and suggest to you that I believe that Christmas, the first part of this, that Christmas is love. That Christmas is love. And I know what some of you are thinking, well, of course it's about love, loving with your family, loving with some being generous and, and giving them gifts and love. But it's not so much about how much we love others, but it's about how much that God loves us. That God loved us so much that he sent his son that he died in your place and my place. He was our substitute. It should have been me dying for my sins, but God loved me so much that he sent his son for me and he sent his son for you that if you would just believe in him that you will have this awesome eternal life. And so I thought about this as Christmas season, talking about Christmas as love, and there's so many ways that we could talk about how much that God loves us, but I believe the Apostle Paul in probably one of the most greatest chapters in the Bible, probably also my favorite chapter in the Bible, it's found in Romans chapter eight. So if you have your Bibles, flip over real quick to Romans eight. If you have your uh, app, you could go with me too on the Bible translation, Romans chapter eight. I, I wanna walk through this because I believe that Paul gives us a beautiful picture of how much God loves us. And I think that if you could really grasp God's love, it would change you because let's just face it, let's just face it. If I ask you right now, does God love you? You're probably gonna give me the Bible answer and say, yeah, 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 God loves me. But I believe there's a lot of you in here, you would say something like this. I know that God loves me, but, 
And then you would go in with some excuse. Hey, I know that God loves me, but man, I still blow it all the time. I'm still not really trying to, I'm still not perfect yet. As if you had to tell us you're not perfect. We already know you're not perfect, okay? So we already know that. So you would say things like, I I know that God loves me, but man, I'm gonna be honest with you, sometimes I don't feel like God loves me. I mean, sometimes I still mess up and I think those thoughts again, or I do that thing again, or I go back to that again, and I, I know God loves me, Pastor. I know the Bible answer. But if I was just completely honest with me, there's sometimes I don't feel like that God loves me. In fact, I feel like God's disappointed in me. I've let God down, that God's mad at me, that I'm not living like I should be living, and therefore, you know, God's just like, mm, he's just waiting just to, to get back at me. So I'm here, I'm glad I'm here, I'm glad you're here, but I'm here trying to maybe, you know, just trying to work through this. I know that he loves me, but sometimes I just really feel that maybe he does. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know there's several of us have walked through that before in our life. I was going, I know he loves me, but I really just don't feel it sometimes, or maybe there's some things in my life that, that he just really hasn't forgiven me of just yet. And so there's all kinds of reasons you fill in the blank. The people says, I know that God loves me, but, and you fill in the blank. But I wanna fill in that blank that says, I know that he loves you, and that I believe that every time you say, I know that God loves me, but, is that you're believing a lie. And today we're trying to eradicate that lie so that when the word of God is preached, which is the seed that lands on the soul, which is your heart, that the devil doesn't come, the Bible tells us, and tries to snatch the seed that's placed in your heart today. So since we know that that's a tactic of the enemy, that as I preach this morning, he's gonna come and try to snatch the seed, and here's what's gonna say. You're gonna say something like this. Oh, that's good for you, pastor, but man, God don't love me like that. Oh, that might be good for somebody else, but not me. That is the devil trying to snatch the seed from taking root in your heart this morning, but you're not gonna let him do it, right? Come on, say amen. You ain't gonna let the devil snatch that from you this morning. You're gonna believe what the truth is. So here we go. We're gonna walk through. got just a few things I wanna point out, and we're gonna start with the first thing. If you're taking notes and you wanna write this down, is this. This is really cool. Is that God has completely forgiven me. God loves me so much, Christmas is love, that God has completely forgiven me. I don't think everybody understands completely. Like, that's completely. Like, God has completely forgiven me of all my past sins, the ones I'll do today, the ones I will do tomorrow. Every sin that I've ever will commit in my entire life, God has completely forgiven me. And most people don't walk around in completeness or wholeness. They're like, hey, man, I don't know if God can forgive me of all my sins because there's still, I think, that one that one sin or that one time or that one issue. I just, I think maybe God's forgiven me of, I don't really know. I know the Bible answer that he's completely forgiven me, but I don't feel completely forgiven. Listen to me, God loves you so much, he has completely forgiven you. There is no more guilt, there's no more shame, no more regrets, no more remorse in Christ Jesus' love. Romans 8, 1 says this, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you should ask the question, why is it there for? Therefore, Romans chapter one through Romans chapter seven. Therefore, all that Paul writes in the beginning, We get to this climax of this chapter, which is unbelievable. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That word no is the strongest negative Greek word in the Greek language. It's no, not never, 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 no, never will God ever condemn you. As Christians, this should be shouting noise for us, that when I put my faith and trust in Jesus, he will never, ever, ever condemn me, ever, my past, My present, my future sins have all been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and he will never condemn me. And now what some people says, well if all my sins are forgiven, then why don't I just go and and live how I wanna live, right? Don't I have a license to sin? When you tell me something that God's forgiven me all my sins and really what you're saying, I can just go live how I want because God's gonna forgive me. I would say this, if that's your attitude, you don't know Jesus. If you're saying how much I can sin, in fact, you know what? Someone asked the Apostle Paul that question. Someone says, hey, because God's grace covers all of our sin, should I sin more so God's grace can more abound? And Paul says, by no means. You see, if you give your life to Jesus and your attitude is how much can I conflict with sin? How close can I get to sin in the world? How close can I look like the world but still be a Christian and still try to flirt with the sin? If that's you, I'm telling you, I don't know if you know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, that he's forgiven you and died for you, you don't wanna flirt with sin, you wanna run from sin. You wanna stay away from it because of what he's done in your life. And when you grasp that he has completely, 100%, forgiven you of all your sins, folks, that will 
make you rejoice with love overflowing like you've never seen in your life. So what does that mean? That means this, that God will never condemn you. And here's why I think we mess up as Christians. There is consequences to every one of your sins. Every sin you do, there's a consequence. There's always consequence. Can you be 100% forgiven? Yes, but is there still consequences? Yes, some of you know that. You made some poor church choices and you made bad decisions and because of that, you get to see your kids every other weekend. It's a consequence to a choice that you made. That's just life. For some of you, you did some things and you have consequences for the rest of your life. Does that mean you've not been forgiven? Absolutely, you could be 100% forgiven. But there's consequences to your sin. And what I personally believe is that a lot of times that Christians believe the consequences is God's condemnation. God does not try to get even with you. God said, ha, huh, you remember? You blew it, I'm gonna get you. Oh, I'm gonna get you now, son, you blew it. God doesn't operate that way. See, God doesn't condemn those who are in Christ Jesus. He convicts us. And his conviction is what leads us to repentance. God doesn't guilt you. Listen to me, hopefully this will set you free. If you've been struggling with guilt and you feel, not feel, to feel dirty and just don't feel guilty and I just don't know if God can, if God has, or if God will, God doesn't guilt you. God convicts you. Here's the difference. The devil will, will guilt you. When you feel guilty, you don't, you don't wanna run to God. In fact, you wanna hide. Ask Adam and Eve. They hid when they realized they sinned because they felt guilty. And their guilt made them run and hide from God. And anytime the devil tries to guilt you, you don't wanna run to God, you don't wanna read your Bible, you definitely don't wanna show up to church, you don't wanna talk to him and pray to him because you feel bad, you feel guilty, you feel dirty because I blew it and therefore God might be mad at me and you kinda hide. That's the devil. God doesn't guilt you, God convicts you. Conviction is I don't care who knows, he forgives me, it's his kindness and I'm gonna come to him. God draws you to himself when conviction. And so the Holy Spirit will convict you, not condemn you, not guilt you, but guide you and lead you. And so I believe the problem is Christians believe that when they walk out their consequences to their sin, and we all, all sin has consequences, that you think it's God's condemnation. That is not God's condemnation. That is the consequences to the sin that you have. God can 100% completely forgive you and I'll never have to be condemned for my sin because Jesus took my place. So if you could just understand the completeness and totality of forgiveness of your sins, that would just unlock another way of how you live in life going, know what, God has completely forgiven me. God knew I would mess up and he still loves me. That's just amazing that God loves us that much. He's completely forgiven me. Here's the second one. And that is that God is working all things for my good and for his glory. God works all things for his good, my good, and his glory. The Bible tells us that God never makes mistakes. We make mistakes, but God never makes mistakes. And here's what I love about God, that God can take my mistakes and still use them in his sovereign plan. Have you ever thought about that? that like, listen, like before I was even born, God knew all the sin I would commit, God knew all the times I would doubt him. God knew all the times I would rebel against him. God knew all the times I would willfully, purposely, purposely sin against him. Not just, oops, I sinned, I did it on purpose. He knew all that, and guess what? He still allowed me to be born, he still saved me, he still called me, and he still anointed me to preach the gospel, and he knew I was gonna blow it. <laughs> Folks, that's love, man. So watch this, this is what I love about God. God takes all my mistakes because he gives us free will, and his sovereignty, because he's in complete control, and he works all my mistakes to become a message for, his, for the gospel. And see, some of you, if you can grasp that, you can relax, because some of you right now, you're so tense of making the right decisions and the wrong decisions and the best decisions and what decisions I'm making. I made mistakes. I've heard people say, man, I blew it. I don't think God can use me. Are you kidding me? Because you blew it, God can use you. He takes our mistakes and he knows it because so many people goes, man, I just, I just feel like I let God down and I made this mistake and God's, listen, God will use all this. He can fit it in his plan. I love what Romans 8, 28 says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to leave this verse up just for a second because I don't want you to miss who this is targeted to. I will work on all things, watch this, for those who love me according to the purpose I have in Christ Jesus. You willfully reject God, you willfully run from God, you willfully deny him, and God says, I'll let you walk out your consequences of rejection. I'll let you walk that out. But you love me, 
and you seek me, everything, even your mistakes, and watch this, even other people's mistakes that have done to you, I will use them for my glory and for my purpose and honestly to advance the gospel because that's what we know what God's up to is expansing the gospel for generation and generations to come. So what does that mean? That means this. Some of you, you're hung up on your mistakes. Listen to me. God already knew you'd make them and he loves you anyway. And he brought you here today so that you would put your faith and trust in him and if you put your faith and trust in him, guess what? He already knew you was gonna do that. He already knew you make mistakes and he still has a perfect plan for you. Even if he blew it as worse as you can think you've ever blown it. God said, I can come in and use it if you'll just surrender your life to me. So God, if I know that he loves me this much, that God is love, that he is working everything that happened to me, everything I actually did, and will work out to his plan. And at the end of my life, when I take my last breath, God can say, yep, that's how I planned it. Because he is in complete control. Now, if we know that, if you will let your, your heart receive that, then why are we so t caught up and, and anxious about all the decision and right and wrong and trying our best to take these mistakes and not make the right mistakes and, and right decisions and, and as parents, that I make the right decision, that I raise them the right way, that my kids are gonna be crazy because of how I raised them and what I did and what I didn't do. And watch as parents, we blame, I've seen parents blame themselves all the time because maybe how a kid chose or rebelled or, or went sideways or done something and they blame themselves and they go back and they go, man, I wish I could have done something different. I wish I would have done this. But I'm here to tell you to set you free. God knew all that. He already knew all that. And you did the very best you could with what you have. We get to the point where honestly, we make and we're accountable for our own decisions and our own choices. And we can't blame other people for other people's mistakes. God's like, no, listen, if you'll just fall in love with me, accept me, I'm gonna work all, everything out for good. So what can I do then this? is just to rest and keep my eyes on Jesus. Just keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm gonna make the very best decisions I can. There's not really a lot of right and wrong decisions. Right and wrong decisions are moral decisions. It's not right or wrong to go to that job or that job. Go to that school or that school. It's not a right or wrong. The moment you make those moral decisions, you'll feel bad when you realize you made, might have made the wrong decision. It's not right or wrong. It's which one's the best. And God, which one do you want me to go to that you can use me? It's not a right or wrong. Some of you right now, you're praying, you're so stressed about right or wrong decision. No, it's a decision. You want blue dress or red dress? Pick one, okay? It doesn't matter what you wear at the banquet, right? I mean, that's not a right or wrong, but you make it feel like that. That's not a moral decision. Which one's best? And so when we really come down to the really right and wrong decisions, really are sin decisions. Is it right or wrong to do that? And there's a come down to sin issues. So what I do, I'm just gonna keep my eyes on Jesus, I'm gonna follow after Jesus, and I'm gonna pursue after him and do what according to his word and live for him. And God says, you do that, I'll even take your mistakes and I'll weave them into the gospel and to the glory and use them for greatness if you'll just trust me. Folks, that is some really, really good news. Here's another one I really love about, the, about this passage is that God is for me. We just sung about that, that God is for me. See, some of you right now, you don't believe that. You definitely don't feel that. You're like, man, if God was for me, then shit. And you fill in the blank. Then why? And you fill in the blank. If God is for me, then why am I struggling financially? If God is for me, then, then why, do, why am I sick? If God is for me, then why did my grandma pass away? If God is really for me, then, and you fill in the blank. See, we think that God's for us when things are going good and when things are going bad, God's against us. That's how our mind understands it. But God is always for me. Now imagine how you could get up and live every day if you knew every single day that God's got your back, that God is for you. How would that change your perspective going to work to, to a job that you don't like or going into a hostile situation that you don't wanna be a part of? Like how would you understand if God is for me? Listen to what Paul writes in Romans eight thirty one. What then shall we say in response to this? all that we've just been listening to. If God is for us, then who in the world could be against us? Who could be against us? Like if God's on my side and my team, are you really, that's all you got? And I'm not talking about you, because flesh and blood is not your enemy. Y'all know that, right? Some of you think your enemy is your coworker, the person, your ex-spouse. They're not your enemy. The devil is your enemy. Well, our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's a spirit and it's a power behind that's your enemy. And so I can look at my enemy and says, greater is he who his enemy is in the world. Get behind me, Satan. Why? Right? Because I have God on my side. I mean, sometimes we've got to get like all mafia on them. You know what I'm talking about? Like you're like, you know who my father is. You know, do you know who my dad is? He take you out, bro. Don't mess with me. You know what I'm saying? Imagine if we had that attitude that God is for me. How would that change how we live? How would that change when we face problems, circumstances, situations? 
Like God is for us. And what's going on in our world as believers, we go like, wait, 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 wait. Wait, God is for us. Now his will will happen how he wants it and suffering is part of God's will. Please let me hear it. Suffering is part of God's will. It's through the scripture. If God did not spare his own son, how in the world will we not suffer? Jesus says, they hated me, they'll hate you. Amen. That's the world. But it's through suffering that God brings out glory and brings us to repentance and brings us to situations to realize how glorious he really is. And so there is part of that in God's. But listen, God is for you, not against you. And one of the biggest things that keeps us from really seeing that is fear. See, when we're afraid, we don't think God's for us. And you can fill in the blank with some areas of your life that you may be afraid of. In fact, psychologists believe, I don't know how they know this and do this, but 645 different fears. There's a fear for everything. There's a fear, if you can, if you can name it, there's a fear for it. And fear will rob you from your joy. Fear will keep you from experiencing the better life. Fear will keep you going, I don't know if God's for me because I'm afraid that I don't have enough money to put food on the table. Well, God, you promised you'd meet my needs. Well, God, I thought you were for me. God, you know, I just job, I just don't know how this is gonna work and, and I'm just, I'm afraid and what you're saying is like, God, you've abandoned me. God's like, no, 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 I am for you because some of your greatest fear is fear of embarrassment, fear of dying, fear of losing your mind. You're afraid of failure. You're afraid of what other people think about you. You're afraid of rejection. But what if they don't like me? What if people don't, what if they disapprove of me? I mean, we could go and fill in the blank. What if, what, I'm afraid I'm gonna disappoint people. I'm gonna disappoint my parents. I'm gonna disappoint my spouse. I'm gonna disappoint my kids. I'm afraid I'm gonna embarrass myself. I'm afraid I just don't fit in. I'm afraid no one likes me. When we have those fears, listen, that will rob us from the joy that God has instead of going, you know what? But God is for me. And if he is for me, then who could be against me? Listen, there are gonna be people in this world, listen, I hate to let you down, that don't like you. And watch this, it's okay because there's seven billion other people who don't even know you. Amen. They are not thinking about you. It's okay. You see what I'm saying, how we lock ourselves? I mean, it's just crazy. Like, you could have 100 people go how much they love you, but there'd be one critic and you're hung up on the critic. Have you noticed that? I kind of remind, I mean, all, of the, all this. Why? Because the enemy wants to do everything he can to be afraid, to be fearful, and not realize that God loves us, he's for us, and he's, he, he, he's gonna work everything out according to his purpose and his plan. So I'm gonna get up every day going, you know what? God, you're for me. No matter what I face today, no matter how hard it may be, no matter the circumstance, you are for me. Here's the fourth thing, if you're taking notes, and this is a big one, it shows how much God loves us, is that God will meet all my needs. This is the big one, especially around Christmas time. Everybody's generous and in the giving spirit and, and I realize that, wait, but then January comes, and then the Visa and the MasterCard bill comes in, right? And then like, whoa, whoa! Honey, do you keep the receipts? We gotta take some of this back, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy. And then you start going, I just, God, I really need you to help. Like, but listen, God will meet all my needs. I love what Romans 8.32 says. Paul writes, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how would he not also along with him graciously give us all things? So if you look at this, he gave up his son to give us all things. He gave up his son to give us all things. God will meet all our needs. You see, Jesus already came and dealt with your biggest problem in your life. That was your sin. The biggest problem you ever had in your life is not your finances or your marriage, your relationship, your parents, and your job, your career, and figuring out where you're gonna major in your life. That is not your biggest problem. You think it's a big problem, that's not. Your biggest problem was sin. And God sent his son to fix that problem. The biggest problem has been dealt with. And if God can fix the biggest problem in your life, which is your sin, how can he not fix your relationships? your job, your career, your school, your finances. You see what I'm saying? Like all the problems, and we all have problems, and you have problems. We all have these things in our life. But the Bible tells us that my God will meet all of my needs according to Christ Jesus' riches. Like he, for the riches of Christ, like he would meet all of my needs, everything that I have. Why? Because he's for me, and he's completely forgiven me. And even in my stupid mistakes, he's gonna work them out for his good and his glory. Wow, that's love. That's how much he loves you. But man, I just don't feel it. But he loves you. 
And I don't, whatever it is that might be blocking you from receiving, I just pray that you will receive that love. So what do we do? We just ask him. And this is probably one of the biggest times we really pray is when we're in need. God, I need you, and you fill in the blank, right? But you'd be amazed how many people don't ask God. Like, how many miracles are you waiting on that you don't even ask God for? He's waiting on you to ask. 20 times in the New Testament it says, ask, seek, knock, and you will receive. But we don't even ask him. We just assume that maybe what? If you feel guilt or he's condemned you, you don't wanna talk to him. But if you realize how much he loves you and accepts you just the way you are, but he's not gonna leave you that way, he wants to change your life, then why won't you run to him and share with you your problems and the issues that go on in your life? So talk to him about it. Seek and ask and say, God, here's the needs I have, and according to your words, you promise that you would meet my needs. Now, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? What do I need to adjust? And listen to him, and he will work in your life. Why? Because he loves you, which leads to my last and final point. And this one really just goes back to where we started in this whole Christmas new series called Christmas is Love. And I'll, this is one of my favorite ones, though. And I, I just hope you just let this sink in, is that God will never, ever, ever, ever stop loving me. That God will never stop loving me. We, it's hard for us to understand this because it's hard for us to fathom unconditional love because everything is based on condition in our world. You love me, I love you. You talk bad about me, I talk bad about you. I for an eye, two for a tooth, right? I mean, you don't like me, I don't like you. It's all based on conditions. But see, God doesn't base it on condition. He bases it on his character. God is love, therefore he, he loves but just because God is love, therefore, remember last week, he is just, which means he does not let sin go unpunished. He will punish sin, not because he hates, not because he's mad, it's because he's just. And because he's just, he's not gonna let sin not go unpunished. God will move in through that. He loves us so much, there's nothing we can ever do to make God stop loving us. Paul writes in Romans eight thirty eight. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, if I die or if I live, there's no angel, no matter how powerful they are, there's no demon, no matter how scary they are. There's no present issue, no future issue. There's no power on the planet. I don't care how high you go, I don't care how low you go, nor anything else in all creation. Did you see that? God's like, there's nothing in the world. No devil, no angel, no demon, no power. Nothing in creation, which watch this, includes you. You're included in that text. Nothing in else in all creation. You are his creation, which means you cannot even separate yourself from God's love. Look what he says. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How does that make you feel known when you blow it? One, God already knew you were gonna do it. Two, he loves you. Three, he forgives you. If you knew that when you blew it, what would that cause you to do? Run and hide? Or come back to your heavenly father going, I just can't believe you love me this much even when I blow it. And what is that called? That type of love, that's eternal salvation love. That God has secured my salvation for all eternity. If I could earn my salvation by working for it, the moment I stopped working for it, then I would lose it. But the reason why I can't lose it, because I didn't earn it. It's a gift, you just have to receive it. And so knowing that my salvation is secure, that my sin will never separate me from God, I will never be condemned, I will be never be judged for salvation purposes, I will be judged on how I lived on planet Earth, the Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians chapter three, I will be judged on that, but not for my salvation. Jesus took that punishment for me. So he doesn't condemn me, he's for me, he loves me, there's nothing I can do to separate it. He's gonna work everything out according to his perfect will for my life. And no matter what I face, this Christmas season, in the heck, being so busy, I can stop for a moment and say, but you know what, he loves me. That Christmas really is love. 
So don't be blinded by all the glamour and glitter and stuff that happens. Stop this season just for a moment and go, wow, even in the midst of chaos, he loves me. Even when I blow it, he loves me. Even when I still will blow it, he still loves me. And if you will just receive that, I promise you it would change how you live every single day of your life. So let's end with how we started. But go back to John 3, 16. For God so loved, Christmas is love, that he gave. This is why we celebrate, he gave his son. That whoever believes, whoever is who we're praying for on December the 19th, whoever you bring, your spouse, your coach, your classmate, your fraternity brother, your sorority sister, doesn't matter who you bring it, that they could become, hopefully that day, one of the whosoevers. Whoever believes, well what? Will not perish, but have eternal salvation. That's eternal life with King Jesus. That's how much he loves you. And here's my prayer today. And I've already been praying for you all morning. Will you receive it? Will you receive his love? I'm gonna ask you what if you just bow your head just for a moment. You know, if you're here this morning or at our Grayson campus or online, I don't believe you're here by mistake. But God brought you here so, you, so I could tell you that he, he's not mad at you, he's mad about you. And he loves you so much. And that Christmas really is love. And I pray and hope that you receive it. You know, I'm just so naive to believe the Bible. And the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and maybe today for the very first time you realize how much God loves you and all these promises that I just mentioned and all these things you want for your life well would you give your life to Jesus now right where you said you could say Jesus I believe I believe you came for me I believe you died for me and I believe you got up out of the grave for me and as best as I know how I'll repent of my sin I'm gonna put all my faith in you Thank you for forgiving me. Now help me follow you all the days of my life. You know, my Bible says whoever will call on his name will be saved. And I pray if you did that today at all of our locations, host is gonna come out just in a moment. They're gonna tell you some next steps. We just wanna know so we can celebrate with you and rejoice what God's doing in your life. And then we'll continue to pray that God will use you and all of us to figure out who we're gonna invite and bring on our Christmas services to hear the gospel so they can experience an abundant life, a full life. We like to say around here, a better life than they've ever dreamed of. Father, we thank you for your word and how relevant it is. Lord, I pray now that you would rebuke the enemy and don't snatch the seed that's been planted, but Holy Spirit, you would water it and cause it to grab roots and grow in our hearts. That we will leave here knowing how much we're loved and even in the midst of our sin, you love us. Yet while we were still sinners, Father, you sent your son for us. And whatever's holding us back from receiving that love, whatever keeping us blinded from it, I pray today, Holy Spirit, you will reveal the truth. And when we know the truth, you will set us free. And we will live every single day of our life, not just the Christmas holiday season, but every day of our life, knowing that you are for us, not against us, and you love us. We love you, Jesus, for it's your name we ask and we pray. Come on now, and everybody said, amen.